the dawn of justice. And uh, I hope you got a study guide. And uh, you'll note there's an interesting picture on the front of that. <laughs> on the dawn of justice today we're dealing with when the monkeys are running the zoo. And sometimes it seems like that's where we are in our nation, Judges 17 and 18. And I'm sure you'll agree with me today that it seems that things are out of control in this world, just not in our nation, but in this whole entire world. Things are not like they should be. Things are not like they could be. God can turn things around, can he? We're living in a world of chaos. Believe it or not, we are. You can close your eyes and pretend that it's not, but it is. We've witnessed moral insanity at record levels in our nation, and in not just our nation, but uh, worldwide. One year ago, the Supreme Court redefined marriage to include homosexual relationships where men can marry men, women can marry women. No, thank you. And if you disagree, then you're labeled a bigot and you're hateful. And uh, I'm neither one of those. But I still believe in the biblical principles of God's Word. And so I'm going by God's Word. Amen. Then we find on May 13, 2016, uh, President decreed that the public schools must allow students to use bathrooms corresponding with their uh, gender identity, not their real gender, but their gender identity. What are we going to? I mean, really. And in the midst of all of this, we're watching this circus we call the presidential for the president of the United States. It's coming up in November, and uh, I tell you, we're in a bad state of affairs. We're living in a time of twisted and and really celebrated logic, twisted logic that's celebrated. We're living in what I think we could surely all identify and say yes and amen to, dangerous times. And let's face it, there's a radical effort to change our nation that just didn't start eight years ago, but it really intensified eight years ago. And that was basically the platform uh, in which our president ran under was the word change. Well, he did not say which way it was going to change, though, did he? And unfortunately, we've changed for the worse. And to be frank, and this is no pun, it just seems like the monkeys are running the zoo. You know? I mean, the, the, uh, the patients are running the insane asylum. You know? <laughs> but I think none of this is new to us. The Bible is, is relevant for today in which we're living and declares exactly the way things are. Boy, he's an interesting looking one, isn't he? Amen. The book, the book of Judges has so much similarity to what we're hearing and experiencing and what is being reported today and this culture in which we're living, there's a clear identification that we are a nation and a culture that is absolutely out of control. The key verse in the book of Judges that underscores these realities is found we have to uh, step forward here to Judges 21 and 25. And it says, In those days there was uh, no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's exactly where we're living today. And that describes the people of America. It describes our leadership. It describes everything about us today. Even our local governments and our state government is horrible. But people are living as if there's no God and they're doing this because this is what they choose. They do not want a God to tell them how to live their life. But I found in my life, as I'm sure you have, when I live by what God says, I live a whole lot better. Amen. Amen. I live a whole lot more blessed. So the only rule today is there are no rules. That's what we're living in. Just as in America, just as America has forgotten today, uh, God so did the nations of Israel back in the Bible days. Israel forgot there was a God. I mean, we've seen that consistently as we've been coursing through the, the chapters in the book of Judges. Within every, within every beating heart is a depravity against God. I mean, people are at war against God. They don't want biblical standards. They don't want God involved in their life, in their society, in their morals or anything. And so what do you get We've got a nation that is absolutely going to the sewer. Amen. We, we were born, really, in this world rejecting the Creator. And you're going to see that as we move through, here, move through this today. 
As we move through Judges 17, we find a third division that is prevalent in the book of Judges. We're moving away from the list of judges that God basically raised up to a place to see that uh, what a nation and that does not honor God looks like. And so we've seen evidence of that. In these final chapters, and we're going to be finishing this because we don't have much further to go. We're running out of chapters in Judges. But in these final chapters, it appears God is saying, look how evil, uh, evil, look how evil Israel has become. And you know, uh, not only do I look and see how evil from the standpoint of what God's word is conveying to us about Israel in that day, but I see so much similarity and a parallel between the day that we're living in and the nations of the world. But also, we've got to come to the point and realize that we too have become a wicked nation. The key word in Judges 17 and 18, I think if you want a key word that will identify it, it's selfishness. And because people are all about themselves and they're not about God. So this raises a question about our present situation and what we're living in. If ours is a world of chaos, which it is, how can we avoid being swept away and compromising our faith. How can we guard against that today? Well, I got three warnings for you today. If we will heed, we can stand against the tide of moral chaos that is happening in our world. And, and the first warning that we find today is stop worshiping God on your own terms. Stop worshiping God on your own terms. There's a real danger today that, you know, people are worshiping God on their own desires, their own terms and the way that they want to. In Judges 17, we're introduced to Micah, and we're introduced to his mother. Now, this is very interesting. Micah and his mother teach us that activity does not necessarily praise God. A lot of people might be active, but is their activity headed in the right direction towards the Lord? Worshiping God on your own terms is just as bad as not worshiping God at all. I mean, you know, it, it's a bad situation and a place to be in. Judges 17, 1 and 2. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which uh, thou cursest and, and spakest of, uh, also in thy, mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, listen to this, blessed be thou the Lord, uh, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, Micah was telling his mother he had, he had broken first the fifth commandment by disrespecting his mother. And he broke the eighth commandment by uh, stealing. And then Micah was not making a sincere confession here. Basically, he was returning uh, the silver because of the curse because his mother said there would be a curse. Well, he's returning the silver because of that. So his mother had placed upon him, basically uh, upon any person who would steal or stole the silver, there would be a curse placed upon them. So he's not concerned about fessing up and getting right. He's just protecting himself from the curse. So in Judges 17, 3, and when he restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly uh, dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Now, Micah's mother's response is also self-serving. Uh, she, re she replaced the curse with a blessing. And, and what this is, it's what we call substitution or superstition, rather. They're, they're hung up in this issue, not about getting right, but trying to cover their sins, and they're more concerned about the superstitions. You know, you'd be surprised how many Christians get up every morning, I don't know if it's still in the newspaper or not, or check online, and they check their horoscope for the day. Yeah. And, and you'd be surprised how many Christians are superstitious people. I mean, they've got certain clothes they don't wear because when they wore those clothes, something bad happened in their life. You know, they don't wear certain socks because they wore certain socks on a particular day 
and, and I don't know, it tripped over the, their feet or something. I don't know, something ridiculous. But you'd be, you'd be amazed, probably some of you sitting here, and we're not going to ask you what they are. Some of you have got superstitions, I, I would surely think today. You're not controlled by superstitions. You're controlled by the hand and the might of our God. Amen. Don't get hung up in superstitions. So the mother gives a silver back to Micah for him to make, and listen to this, to make a graven image, a false god. And so Micah was making an image of Yahweh, but their worship of God was a form, and it was on their own terms. You can't worship God on your terms. Well, I'll, I'll serve the Lord when I get pet. No, you better start serving the Lord now. Well, I, I'm going to give God glory when I get through. No, you can't give God glory when you get through. You need to give God glory now. And so Judges 17, 4 says, Yet he, he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. Now, in addition to the pagan images, they now have, they have an image of Yahweh also. Listen, folks. Uh, you don't need no images when you've got the one true living God with you. Amen. You've got the presence of Almighty God, the God who says, I never leave you, nor do I forsake you. So Micah disregarded the command of God, for God had said in Deuteronomy 12, these things in Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 14, and the people were, in, in to, were to worship God in Shiloh and the place of God's choosing rather than in private shrines. Listen. You don't need shrines in your house. Amen. You don't need things today. And sometimes we get hung up even with the jewelry that we wear. And don't misunderstand me here. But we wear crosses and still got Jesus on the cross. And we wear crosses thinking they're going to bring us good luck. We wear jewelry and things that we think is a good luck charm. God's not a good luck charm. God's your deliverer. God's your helper. God's your provider. God watches over you. And you don't need anything that would identify except your life of trust in the Lord. That God can take care of you every need. So then Micah consecrates one son as a priest. So we go to verse 5 and it says, the man of, And the man Micah had a house of gods. Note that, not a capital G, not a singular uh, version here. Little g with an S on the end. And made an ephod and a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now, they have a homemade religion. It, it's amazing today how many people have a homemade religion. And a lot of times that homemade religion go back to, well, tradition, you know, this, this is what grandpa and grandma and great-grandpa and all this one and the other one did, and, you know, uh, I, this is the way the church has always done it. Well, let me tell you something about that. If it doesn't agree with this, it's wrong. Amen. And you don't have to live today by tradition. As a matter of fact, Peter said, put away your vain traditions and serve God. And so we need to understand today that, that they were worshiping God on the wrong motive and on their own terms. How do you worship God? Well, Jesus told the woman at the Samaritan well, he, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, he said, you've got to worship me in spirit and in truth. And that's how we worship God. There's nothing more homemade than religion. See, religion today is man trying to get to God's presence on his own merit, ways, thoughts, ideals, and ideologies. That's not the way God's word is written. You come to God on his terms. Hallelujah, you come by the way of the cross. And today you trust the Lord. The same God that delivered you from, from sin into salvation is the same God who's with you and for you today. In our churches today, we have a similar problem. We worship the way that we want to and we ignore much of what God has said in his word. Well, we do what feels good. I mean, this has become so prevalent. We substitute religious activity for a vital relationship with God. Well, I'm religious. Yeah, but you better be careful of that. You might be religious, but you might still be lost. And folks, there's a lot of people out there that have sincere efforts, but their efforts does not line up with what God's Word says. Preacher, you're pretty hard this morning. I'm just telling you the truth. We hear these ridiculous comments. It matters not what you believe as long as you're sincere. Wrong. It's not your sincerity. 
It's your separation to Christ. Amen. All religions do not represent different paths to God. And I've heard people say this, you know, we're getting, I, we're getting to heaven on this and we're getting to heaven on that. We've been baptized and we're doing our good works and we're on 25 committees and boards and we're this, that, and the other. And we send checks to every uh, preacher that comes on television, on the radio, and we support every goodwill effort and everything else. And we're just doing all we can. That's the problem. You're trying to get to God on your own terms. See, that's a religion way when you can come by the way of the cross and that's the only way that is acceptable unto God. Now, so many of these religions today are not serving the God of the Bible. You say, well, preacher, there's many churches and there's churches all around the world and churches in America and churches in Lynchburg. Well, that is great, but are those churches representing this, the Word of God? Now, I'm going to pick on somebody this morning, and maybe you're one of his fans, and if, I, uh, if you are, then that's your choice. He's not mine. Joel Osteen is a pastor of probably the largest church in America today. Yet, he never talks about sin. You watch his program. You watch it for a week and tell me how many times, mark down how many times he talks about the cross and about sin and about the blood of Jesus. I promise you, it won't be much if it's any. Yet, he talks about everything in the Bible that is basically offensive. <laughs> Christianity is not just speaking positive words. You know, Norman Vincent Peale, bless his heart, he was the power of positive thinking. You can't think positive until you get Jesus in your heart that gets in your mind. I'm an advocator of being positive, but let's face it today. We face trials and difficulty. You can't walk out into the world every day and thinking the sun is shining and everything's great. Well, sometimes every day is not great. And some days, even though the sun is shining, you don't see it. And you go through trials. Christianity is just not speaking positive words for yourself. You know, God has a method, a plan, a way. And when you follow his method, his plan, his way, you'll get into the place that God has for a blessing. You just can't say, I'm thinking positive, I'm speaking positive, I'm believing positive. You've got to live the word of God, which will create an attitude and an atmosphere so God can do positive things in your life. You can't ignore the source of the blessing. Amen. God's not a bellhop, ding, 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 Jesus, Jesus, hello, hello, I need help. That's not the way we serve God. As a matter of fact, he should have the bell. Amen. <laughs> the mentality of today in so many churches is, well, just live your best life now rather than taking up your cross and following Jesus. See, they have gradually, subtly removed and taken out the cross. They've taken out the blood. They've taken out the, the word of God that exposes our sin. So many in churches today, the great I am is not the son of, God, son of God that died for our sins on the cross, but the great I am now is me. You know, I am great. I, 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 got, I can do all things through me. No, you can't do all things through you. You can only do all things through Christ, which strengthens you today. So this thing says, you can be your own God. No, you can't. You cannot be your own God. There's only one true living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you're not trusting him, you're trusting the wrong God. And if you're trusting yourself today to be a God, let me tell you what, it's not going to work. You were not here when, they, when God created the heavens and the earth. You were not here when he grabbed a handful of dirt and formed and made man in his image and gave him the breath of life. We may have the power of God in us, but let me tell you what, we're not God. We've got to realize what we really are. This is where it brings us to an altar We've got to realize we're a sinner saved by grace. And we, we serve the one true living God. So, realize this today. You know, when, when you don't mention the cross and the blood of Jesus today, they're implying there's nothing wrong with us. Well, tell me why Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> I mean, he died to save sinful man. But... There is something wrong with us, and here it is. 
We are sinful without the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't misunderstand. God can turn your life around. God will turn your life around. But you've got to be willing to give God your life so he can turn it around. Amen. You're looking at an example. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, I'm born again, washed in the blood. I'm not perfect. You're not either. But I have been delivered. And glory to God, God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Glory. Amen. So you just can't keep God, uh, and keep a God of your own making today. You can't punch the buttons and make God be what you want him to be. We, we don't mind being religious as long as it doesn't get in our way of how we are living. Let me tell you what. If you're living wrong and you're a child of God, God's going to expose it to you. He's going to show you. It's called conviction. So you, you can't pick and choose what you like about God. You can't start ripping out of the Bible and say, I, I'm not going to read that because that's got to do with how I should live. And I'm not going to read that. That calls me a sin. I'm not going to read that. That risks, but I mean, and we, next thing you know, all you've got is two, well, you don't even have a cover left. Because the cover says Holy Bible. <laughs> Amen. We have just enough religion to make ourselves feel better. And just enough to make God sick. Amen. You can't worship with your predetermined ideals today. So you, can, you can't justify your sins Thank God they must be forgiven and they must be forsaken. So Judges 17, 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You cannot worship God on your own terms. You can't, you can't serve God with your predetermined ideals. You've got to serve God with his plan that he's directed for your life. Number two, stop working for God on your own terms. Going on in verse 7 and 8, and there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. Now, this young man was a Levite. And this, uh, the Levites were priests in Israel. Uh, as a matter of fact, this young man is Jonathan. And the Bible says he was a young man. So to be a functioning priest, something's wrong with this. The, in Israel, you've got to be at least 30 years of age. You do a little check-in in your Bible, and you'll find that. The young man is not a man of God, but he's a hireling looking for work. So in Judges 17, 9, And Micah said unto him, uh, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. Hmm. Ministry for this guy is security, acceptance, and approval. He's looking for the perks and the bennies. So what have you got to offer me? I mean, that was his mentality. Now look what happens in verse 17, uh, 17 10. And Micah said unto him, dwell with me, and he... And, and he uh, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals, that means food. So the Levite went in. Now, the, the price was right. He wanted the money, but he didn't want the ministry. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? He wanted the money, but he didn't want the ministry. He wants the perks and the bennies. He wants... Everything, let me tell you, read on, verse 11, 12. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his, his priest and was in the house of Micah. Now, the young man, <clears throat> excuse me, became Micah's priest, but not God's. Amen. We got a lot of... Mama sent and daddy called out there, and God's not on them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Picking on preachers this morning. Hallelujah. Some of them need to be picked on. This, this young man, he's not God's priest because he's in it for the money. His, his consecration... And his concentration, rather, is all about himself and money. So when a pastor is led by his sheep, rather than leading the sheep, he's not a man of God. Amen. Thank you, pastor. Do you need me to tell you that one again? When a man is led by the sheep, 
and is not leading the sheep, he is not a man of God. So Micah had a cultic shrine. Let me tell you, anything that you put above and ahead of God is cultic, is wrong. And that man of God, and so he wouldn't rebuke him for it. The man of God remained silent because he's serving God on his own terms. And by the way, he did not want to, as the old saying goes, upset the apple cart. So this man of God was typical of what Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come when they, not, when they shall not endure sound doctrine. Now that's not only in the pulpit, that's also in the pew. That people don't want to endure sound doctrine. We want an easy believism. We want something to make us feel good. We want something that comes with no commitment, no responsibility. And folks, that's not what the Word of God says. What you got from Jesus comes with a responsibility. And it comes with the fact that we are to be separated, consecrated unto the Lord. If every church in Lynchburg closes their doors and will not preach the gospel, let me tell you what, as long as I'm in this pulpit, this is the only message I'm going to preach. Amen. Because this is the only message I know. Hallelujah. I can't compromise and please God. Preachers are not to preach what people want to hear. People are, uh, preachers are to preach the word of God, or God's word, that people need to hear. We need to hear the word of God. That's what's going to get you blessed. That's what's going to get you free. That's what's going to get you where God can pour out his blessings upon you today. This preacher in Judges 17 is Jonathan, as I mentioned, and his priority of preaching is much of what we're hearing from the pulpits and across the airways of today. Health and wealth. Health and wealth. You just do this and you're going to be wealthy. Do this and you'll never have a sick day. We are living in a decaying, dying body. Hello. Thank God he's still the healer. But that doesn't mean that you're going to have perfect health and doesn't mean that you're going to have so much money you don't know what to do with. Hello. Big returns for those who work for God. That's what they're saying. Boy, just do this and do that, and you can wear slick suits that cost a thousand bucks and alligator shoes and all this other stuff, and man, you can drive uh, Lexus and BMWs and MOUSEs and anything else. I mean, hallelujah. Let me tell you what. I'm rich, but I'm rich in the presence and the power and the spirit of the Lord. This world's not my home. I got something far better awaiting me. But you know what? If I will submit myself to God, God said, I will bless you. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Your leaf won't wither, and whatsoever you do will prosper. That means be blessed. All right, let me hurry up. See, if you're not preaching the Christ of the cross and the whole counsel of the Bible, you're not serving God. Amen. So Judges 17, 13, then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to be my priest or to be my priest. Yeah. So he's got the priest living in the house. He got the preacher living in the house. He thinks, man, I'm cool. Everything's cool. I, I got it made. Amen. Micah thinks God is obligated to bless him because now he has his own priest. <laughs> the kingdom of God, by the way, is not for sale. Amen. You don't come to Christ deserving forgiveness and peace. But hallelujah, I'm glad that through the sacrifice of the cross, he gives it. Amen. Serving God is not about what you gain, but it's about what you give to him. And you've got to be willing to give it all to him. And let me give you the third thing because I'm about out of time. But let me throw one more scripture in here for you that will just tickle your fancy this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Number three, stop walking with God on your terms. You can't make a deal with God. Amen. 
The problem is Christians are trying to walk with God, but they're ignoring the Word of God. You can't walk with God without the instruction book. Because you know what? You're going to mess it up. It's kind of like you get those things, and you got 10,000 screws and nuts and bolts. you got a gazillion pieces that's marked A to Z, and then A1, A2, then this part, that part. And you think, yeah, I don't need the instructions. I can put that thing together. I can put a million of those. I know all about how to do that. And then after two hours of you wrestling with the thing and losing your patience, then you say, where's that instruction book at, honey? And you have to tear down everything that you put together because it doesn't even resemble what you bought. You know what I'm talking about. I've been there and done that. And you've wasted your time. See, when you're not following God's word, you're wasting your time in God's too. Man, just do what the book says. That's about as plain and as simple as I can make it today. We cannot ignore God's word. You cannot be in his will when you're living contrary to God's word. When you're living in sin and won't come out of it, you're not going to be blessed. Hello, y'all. Judges 18.1. You're saying, man, I know we're going to cover two chapters. Well, this is going to be quick and powerful and, and easy. In those days... There was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them, the tribes of Israel. So the Danites were known for their disobedience to God, for their unfaithfulness to the Lord. They wanted to walk with God, but there again, it's the same old story. They wanted to walk with God on their own terms, and in verse 2, they sent spies into the land where Micah was at, and further they were about to take the land in verse 5, and then they asked for them uh, to pray if it's God's will for them to prosper. <laughs> They're violating God's will, and they want to know if God will bless their disobedience. How stupid is that? How many times do we think, well, I go to church, I try to make it to church, and we think, well, and you're living like the devil in, in the rest of your life, and you think just because you went to church and you put a Bible under your arm that God's obligated to bless you. No, he's not. And he won't. He can't. They ask them to pray if it's God's will for them to prosper. And they're violating God's word. You cannot be blessed when you're in disobedience. So Micah tells them what they want to hear. And that's what's happening in a lot of pulpits across our nation and across our town. Judges 18 and 6, and the priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord is before the Lord is your way wherein you go. So Micah should have warned them of their disobedience. He should have said, Guys, you're on the wrong track here. You're, you're serving God on your own terms. You're, you're living wrong. You're living in sin. God can't bless that. But you know what? He wanted to be a people pleaser. You can't really qualify to preach the word if you're a people-pleasing preacher. You've got to preach the word of God. Amen. And we need to hear that. Church ought to say amen to that. Amen. Christians try to put spiritual language around the disobedience, and believe me, it doesn't work. We know the phrases, and we get the smile, and we got the look, and we think, man, I tell you, I'm just slicker than hot butter. They, they plan to take the land, and they plan to take Micah's idols from his home. Now listen to what happens in 17, 18. I've really got to hurry here. And, and these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved images, the ephod, the teraphim, and the molten image. And, they, and then said the priest unto them, What do ye? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. In other words, they said, Preacher, shut up! Amen. <laughs> you ever felt like that? Don't answer that. And go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. It is better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel. You know, what has happened is a hireling preacher just got a better offer. So he's going to check out. Micah was robbed. Micah was abandoned. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. You can read verse 24. And, and if you, you know, 
if you made it, here's the point. If your religion is all made on you, it's not going to please God and it's not going to work. Just because things fall into place, we reason, well, it's got to be the will of God. I mean, we, God, show me a sign. Let the next corner I turn, let this happen or let something, uh, let me see a, a nickel laying on this, a penny. I mean, we can come up with the most far-fetched baloney to try to get it. Why don't you just serve God? You'll fall right into the will of God. Amen. So if you're going to serve God, you've got to walk with God yourself. Amen. Every generation must learn to walk with God for themselves. You cannot violate God's word and walk with God. So, in closing, after I've given you all this insight and wisdom from Judges 17 and 18, I got good news for you. There is a better way, and his name is Jesus. You'll never go wrong with following him. Put him first. Serve him, love him, live for him, and watch what God will do in your life. Father, thank you for the precious word. Thank you for the time that you afforded us this morning to get through this particular lesson. And I pray it's been received, and Lord, I pray it'll be a blessing to your people. I pray today that you'll bless the service we're about to enter into. May the Holy Spirit just come down and tabernacle with us. May sinners get saved, lives be changed, hearts be blessed. And may you today do a mighty work in the hearts and the lives of people here today. We bless your name, O Lord, and we thank you. Help us to live for you and be sold out to the cause of Christ. And we'll say to God be all the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's servants say to a hearty, what? Amen. And the people of God put their hands together and did what? Praise the Lord.